Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm just going to ask everybody to say hi on the chat, just so I know that you're listening and you can hear me before we start. So just doing some technical checks first. It is a glorious day for learning, Gareth. I agree. OK, so hi, 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 everybody. OK, so let's just do all the tests first. So Nimish, can you say something, please? And then everybody can type hello for Nimish, please. Hi, I hope everyone can hear me uh, here from glorious East Midlands. Well, it's quite cloudy outside, but it's good. So I hope everyone can hear me here. OK, should be good. And Mary, can you say hi, please? And everybody just type yes if you can hear Mary. Oh, hi, everybody. Good to be on this call with Flavia and Nimish. Uh, it's going to be a great session. Thanks for including me. Brilliant. All right. So uh, I think it's all good. So I'm going to give you some general information about how this is going to go and also leave, get people some time to, you know, people who are always a little bit late so they can join us before we start. So just a few general things. First, uh, everything is going to happen via the chat. So obviously, we're here talking to you. You will type your comments, type your questions, type whatever you want to say on the YouTube chat. And we can all see why you're writing. And then we're going to answer those questions. Well, Mary and Nimish will answer those questions live. So make sure you ask a lot of questions. The more questions, the better. They love questions. So just type everything you want to know, everything you want to comment, everything you want to share. If you want to share anything from your own experience, your own school, go for it. It's always nice because we have people watching who are from different subjects, primary, secondary, different parts of the country, probably international as well. So it's always good to hear different experiences. So that's the first thing. So use the chat, please. I'm even going to put that on the screen there. So use the YouTube chat. Second thing is the, yeah, that's basically it. That's the main thing. So use the chat. Uh, uh, we're going to start with Nimi. So I'm just going to finish the introduction. Then Nimi will give his talk. We're going to have um, time for Q&A. Then we're going to have a quick five minute break just for like get a cup of tea. And then Mary will give her presentation. So there will be plenty of time for us to learn everything with these very brilliant educators. Uh, and there's one more thing, which is Twitter. So obviously, we are not together on the same conference venue, but we can still bring the conversation like further. So go on Twitter, tag. You can see. Let me remove this. Oh, Mary doesn't have it. Let me just edit Mary's name. Well, but Mary's hashtag is just her name. So Mary Myatt. So go on Twitter and tag me or Nimish or Mary and use hashtag SenecaCPG. So that's the one we use so that everybody can find everybody while we're talking about this event. Again, the more messages, the more you're free to screenshot and share this, share with your thoughts. Just the more we have this conversation on Twitter, the better. And everybody keeps learning more and more even after the talks are over. OK, so I'm going to leave like one minute without saying anything to see if anybody has any questions before we start. Um, People are introducing themselves, keep doing it. Yeah, it's great. If not, then uh, cool, then we can start. So I will remove Mary. Mary, you come back later. So I'll remove you for the minute. And Nimish here, I'm going to add your screen. Fantastic. Okay. Can everybody see Nimish's screen, please? Can you just say yes on the chat? Yes. Yep. Good. Okay. So, Nimi, go. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Flavia. And it's it's great to be here um, today to talk about modelling uh, within the curriculum. So, I'm Nimish Lad. Um, I'm uh, vice principal at Wren School um, in Wellingborough uh, in the East Midlands. I can see quite a few people from the East Midlands have commented in the chat, which is it's lovely to have to have people. I think North Ants specifically is such a great area right now in terms of the work taking place around curriculum and research informed strategy. So it's it's wonderful. We wonderful to be talking from home and talking to so many people that, that know the region so well. 
Um, as one of my other roles, I'm um, at the Creative Education Trust. I'm their curriculum and research lead. Um, so a lot of the work that I do there is around um, curriculum and how it can impact on, on students and how actually curriculum is the biggest lever in terms of um, as Flavia mentioned, I'm available on Twitter at nlad84. So if you ever want to catch up with anything that I've been talking about in greater detail, feel free to, to drop me a tweet. Um, and I blog at The Research Teacher um, as well, which is available from my Twitter. Um, much of what I'm talking about today, I've blogged on in the past. So you can you can have a reread afterwards. Some of the resources that I reference are also there on the blog. So what I'm talking about is how modelling is used within the curriculum to deliver this awesome curriculum that we've spent so long designing. And I know that Mary is gonna talk a lot more about the principles behind curriculum design today. Uh, what I'm gonna be talking about is how we actually go about implementing our curriculum once it's been designed um, in such a robust and ambitious way. So we've got this curriculum. It's been grown from our team. We've all spent hours planning, planning it carefully, sequencing it, thinking about where things are actually placed. We've got that real careful sequencing in place there. And now we've got to go about implementing it. Now we've got to go about putting it in front of our students, ensuring that it lands with our students, um, ensuring that our students uh, access the, the knowledge that we've sequenced in such a careful way. And to do that, we're going to need some form of research of one culture. We know that through research, we have a good understanding of how students learn um, and what strategies we can use as teachers to ensure that students learn. And as part of that, we've got to find a way of developing better curriculum explanations. And once we've got those explanations across the students, they've got to find a way of practicing that first with ourselves so that we can guide that practice. And then to a point where students can go away and practice themselves this amazing knowledge that they've learned from us and ensure that it's embedded for the long term and not just there for a day and then lost. So how can we go about doing these things? How can we develop excellent explanations and also finding the space for practice so that students can learn the knowledge that we've taught them and retain it for the long term? The key thing with all of this is doing practice right. It can't just be practice that students are doing that they uh, rattle through quite quickly or that they are practicing misconceptions that they've learned through poor explanations, but actually that they're practicing the right things in the right way. So part of my reading and the books there behind me um, is, is Practice Perfect by Doug Lamov. And it was one of, one of the best books I've ever read about the idea of how to get practice right. And while it's focused more on how we can, how we can develop um, practice within teachers and how teachers teach, I, I took a lot of messages from this about how we can work with students and ensure students learn by developing that right cultural practice and really thinking carefully about how we sequence practice within our classrooms and within our curriculum. So the, the first thing that I'd like to go through is this whole idea of modelling. So modelling is something that we've done time and time again as teachers and, and right now I'm modelling um, my, my talk behind research form culture, my talk behind how I use modelling within the curriculum and we model explanations all the time for our students. We say things in a certain way, we model language, we model vocabulary, we model sentence structure to students in a real clear way so that they understand how we talk within our subject, within our curriculum. And as we model, we need to consider, do we actually describe what we're doing? Do we actually describe specifically, well, these are the key parts of this model, these are the key parts of this explanation that I'm using to model an idea across to yourselves. Do we, do we call our shots within the model? Do we make it really, really clear before we actually engage in a process modeling with a learner what we want them to be looking for within this and what we're looking for afterwards? Do we make our models believable? So do our students actually believe that when they walk out of this classroom, they're going to be able to use this model in a way that will lead to them being successful, be that in examinations or be that in explaining an idea in, in future learning? Do we go through the process of super modeling? Are we just modeling a key part of curriculum content that we in the explanation that we're trying to go across? Or are we modeling larger areas of knowledge behind that? Are we just saying, well, this is how I deliver an explanation for Newton's third law, which I'm going to go through in more detail today? Or are we saying, well, this is how I model a good explanation for stop, so that when you're explaining an idea, you use these similar ideas as well with it? Do we encourage students to, to walk this way, to so walk the way that we've put across in the model? Are we making it really clear that we want students to imitate that when we go through modelling within the curriculum? 
do we really model the skinny parts? So do we do we really zoom in on the, the complex singular steps that make up an explanation, that make that make up that accruement of knowledge that students actually have and make that really clear with our students? Do we also model the path? So we go through the process as well as the product. Do we just say, well, this is what I want you to be able to say by the end of this explanation? Or do we craft our way to that explanation so students understand the process behind how we got there? And actually, are we ready for a close up? So are we ready for us to really zoom in and capture models and analyze what's good about them and what, what's not so good about them? And can we do that with our explanations as well? So the whole premise for the first part of this is talking about how can a robust process of modeling ensure that our curriculum lands in the way that we're expecting it to land. So let's go through modeling and describe first. So when we're modeling and describing, modeling helps students replicate ideas. So it helps them take an idea and then do that again. Describing helps students understand why that model does what it does. And if we use the two together, learners can flexibly apply what has been taught. So we've got to think carefully about what process we should do this. First, we want students to understand. We want them to know the why behind what we're doing. So first we describe and then we get students to model and we describe by breaking it down into small chunks. We're doing this and then we're going to be doing this and we're going to do this and this is the reason why. A clear explanation leaves little to chance. So if we model an explanation really, really clearly, it leaves little to chance in terms of what a student can actually learn and therefore decreases the chances of misconceptions building. And models create exemplars that you can then talk through afterwards with students. You're probably really wary that novice learners need more um, more guidance uh, th than, than a singular model. So sometimes they need um, extra knowledge around that model to help them access it. Um, and a description alone leaves a lot of space for things to go long. So if we're describing without modeling, then students can sometimes jump quite quickly to misconception. When we're calling our sh shots, we need to think before we actually model what is clear to the learner about what they're what we're actually asking them to look for or what are the learners looking for and actually what we're doing here so which specific parts of the model are we trying to exemplify what specific parts of the model are absolutely crucial for a student to understand for them to be able to engage in their learning further down the line and sometimes we can provide examples and non-examples to actually allow us to really clearly show this is what i'm after and this is what i'm not after Making models believable. So when we're thinking about making models be believable, we model in a context that's similar to how students are going to be using that knowledge in the future. So if they're going to be using this knowledge in an assessment of some sort, we model it in a context that's similar to an assessment. So while we first deliver an explanation through a, through a model to make it really clear to students, we should be able to then take that model and say, well, this is what it will appear like in the exam, and this is why you'll be successful if you understand this model. Live modeling is also more believable than pre-recorded modeling. If I'd pre-recorded this presentation and I removed all these little stumbling bits that I do whenever I talk, it's, it's less believable that I am the person that I am in terms of an educator talking through this idea and thinking through it while I'm talking through it. It all becomes a bit more prescribed. So why, because I'm doing it live, it's clear to yourselves that I'm thinking about these ideas while I'm talking to you about them. And the same thing is just as is happening all the time with our students. If we live model, students are more likely to make it to think this is a believable model that I'll be able to use in an exam. And while and while pre-recording modeling has that benefit that it can be used at any time, live modeling has that huge benefit of actually building motivation for students of helping them understand well actually I can use this at any time. So with super modeling, you model not only what you're teaching, but the future skills that you wish your students to apply. So it could be about an explanation for a certain idea, but it could also be how you craft an explanation or how you apply an explanation to a situation. So supermodeling goes beyond just an idea that we're trying to explain, but takes it further in terms of how can that explanation therefore be used or, or how did that explanation come about in a variety of complex, in a variety of different contexts. So what this allows us to do is model our overall exportation, uh, expectations of the learner. Even if we've already called our shots, we can make it really clear what we're expecting of our students. It also allows you to have this constant positive tone and high energy throughout your delivery that, you know, it's not only this, but it's this, and it's this. So there's, there's lots of things for us to focus on if we're super modeling. 
but also it allows us to ask for feedback about how we're actually crafting explanations. And therefore our students can really engage with us about how our explanations um, are being crafted to, to aid them in their learning. So when we're talking about walking this way, we're asking learners to imitate a model exactly as it's shown to them. Now, this is quite a powerful idea, especially with novice learners. When they come across an idea for the first time, we want to, to limit the chance of misconceptions arriving with, with uh, poor or woolly explanations. Um, so what we need to do is get them to, to imitate exactly as we want them to do it. So this ensures that novices or, or learners often at the start of a, of a unit directly imitate the model that we're saying. Learners could misapply this model if we're not careful, giving it their own spin. Um, and what that might mean is that misconceptions can develop. So learners analyzing a model could analyze it incorrectly, but get the so could analyze it correctly, sorry, but get the application of it wrong. So we've got to make sure that when we're asking students to, to imitate a model exactly as, as we've done it, when we're asking students to walk this way, not only are they analyzing a model, correctly but they're applying it correctly as well when we talk about modeling skinny parts of an explanation or skinny parts of a model that we're asking students to, to engage with we're asking them to think about the single steps and repeat them time after time so they become fluent with applying them in a variety of situations and if we model them really really clearly to students that i always do this then i do this with an explanation that makes a great great difference to how students understand the craft behind what good explanations actually mean, what good curriculum explanations actually mean. When we go through this idea of modeling skinny, of skinny parts of explanations, we can't assume there's any prior knowledge of our students. We have to make sure that we, that we go through every small part of our explanation in absolute detail. And we need to make sure that we repeat until mastery is achieved. Once we've gone through each of these small steps, make sure that we keep going until students have completely mastered the content of that explanation. When we're modeling the path, we're talking about the process as well as the product. So, you know, learners need to understand why we're taking the steps that we are in the sequence that we're taking them so that we can get to a certain point. If we focus only on the end result, that negates the steps that it took for actually people to get there. So if we think about how knowledge builds over time, that's what we model when we model the path. We need students to understand that the, the prerequisite knowledge that they've understood behind a, concept, behind a concept actually is important, just as important in that explanation as well as what we've just been taught that lesson. And again, going back to this idea of, of a close-up. So once we've captured models, be that recorded or, or be that on paper, we can analyze them, we can use them again and reuse them. And we can actually pull them apart to see how they worked and how they didn't work. So once we've got really robust explanations and really robust models, we've got to get into the habit of practice. And we've got to make sure that our students can go away and practice using these models um, that, they've, that they've learned throughout the curriculum. And there's many things that can come about over here. So we need to normalize error. Quite often through the process of going through practice, errors come about. Students make mistakes, we all make mistakes. But it's important that actually there's an understanding that a, a culture of practice leads to students being okay with making mistakes. We need to break down the barriers to practice. We can't have those questions in the classroom where uh, a student says, oh, but I've done that seven times already. Well, well it, it doesn't matter. You know, we do it again and again and again until we always get it right. Now, this might sound like a strange one in terms of make it fun. And, and I think a, a lot of what I'm trying to say with this and a lot of what the mob was trying to say with this was, what do we actually mean by this idea of fun? This isn't necessarily fun about making it a competition or making it uh, exciting in any other way, but actually making it fun in, in terms of ensuring that it's not dull. How are you adding to this to make sure it's not exactly the same thing every single time, but slightly different to make it engaging for students? We want to make sure that when we do practice, everybody does it. So it's, it's, a, it's a collective activity that everybody in the class engages with, including the teacher. And that actually allows us, therefore, to leverage peer-to-peer -peer accountability, where students can hold each other to account, have mutual commitments to each other to ensure that they're pushing each other forward through their process of practice. And therefore, a key part of this is praising the work that students uh, do. So we praise the actions that are taking place, not the traits. 
So the, the, the process here as well that students are engaging, we have to praise that. So the actions that students are making, not the traits that they're actually showing as part of this. So normalizing error, how do we go about this? Well, we need to encourage calculated risk taking and challenge within practice. We need to make sure that actually we are challenging students while going through the process of practice. We need to ensure um, that students um, have an idea of how to identify errors and that we can help them do that. And that we practice responding to errors. Quite often, this is a practice that we don't model with students or make particularly clear with students. We ask them to make corrections without saying, well, actually, if you make a mistake, this is how you go about making a correction to ensure that you never make that mistake again. When we're breaking down barriers, we have to overcome them by removing them um, and diving into practice. So making sure that students understand that while practice sometimes is difficult because you're doing the same thing time and time again, um, it's actually important because it builds fluency and ensures that we build to this point of, of understanding knowledge in such a, a, a good way that we can build on it for further learning. So in terms of making it fun, as I mentioned, it's not always about competition, but it could be about competition. So friendly competition could be could be um, implemented here. We could also incorporate ideas as a surprise to keep students on their toes. So if we're using an idea and we're varying the context, sometimes the elements of surprise can be slipped into there through using different contexts to ensure that students are kept on their toes. As part of this idea of making it fun, tying into with this idea of peer-to-peer -peer accountability, we could encourage students to support each other and praise each other as part of practice, ensuring that all the students therefore get a chance to practice. However, what we can't do when we're, we're trying to make practice that little bit more fun is lose focus on the objective of what we're trying to do here, which is actually encourage students to practice a specific explanation or a specific part of the curriculum. So we can't be focusing too much on the fun elements rather than the practice elements. Ensuring everybody does it is, is absolutely crucial because then what we can do then is model the process of practice to the class. If everybody's engaging in that process, where we can actually model the process that we're wanting students to do to everybody. It allows us also to ask for feedback on our demonstration of practice. So we can ask quite quickly about whether things are actually gonna make a difference in terms of students learning. And in, we could use language that highlights that everybody will practice. And if we do that quite often, it means that students could, uh, are, are, more, are more likely to engage in practice outside of the classroom. So one of the things that I've done quite often with this idea of a all engagement practice is, is ask students three things that I could improve um, or, or have done on my own to better my own practice. So by engaging with this process, we all understand that practice is a key part of learning. So when we talk about leveraging peer-to-peer -peer accountability, we're talking about the idea of allowing students in groups to self-identify as a knowledge uh, that they want to grow. So this is based on feedback that we've given them. And that encourages students to make mutual commitments to each other um, and support improvement and therefore further practice. So for this to work, we need to ensure that feedback is used as a tool for people to identify their own knowledge needs. And that needs to be consistently delivered. We need to ensure that both parties, so both parties within this, this peer commitment that takes place, this, this peer to peer accountability that takes place, uh, we need to ensure that both parties benefit from these commitments that they're going to make and that students are made aware that they need to make each other and hold each other accountable. When we talk about praising the work, as I mentioned before, we're talking about praising actions and not traits. So we're praising the process that pupils are working through um, and the repeated use of this process rather than the, the product that comes out of this necessarily. So we can't praise something that's a, a one-off result. We've got to praise the fact that students have continually gone through a process. We also need to separate acknowledgement from praise. Acknowledgement is there to say what well, you've done as asked. Praise is there to almost say, well, excellent, look at what you've done because of this. Look at, look at what you can do now. And we need to create a process, therefore, for recognitions. So what is it that allows us to, in, in terms of just acknowledgement, and what is it that allows us to actually engage in that process of praise? So if you want some more advice on this, including practical examples of, of these in action, there's some great um, blogs that are written on the whole idea of modelling and the cultural practice. And, and I know modelling is an idea that, that has been around for a while, as is practice, but 
what I think is missing, especially from a curriculum lens, is, is that careful thought about how modeling can be used to, to maximize the impact of our explanations in classroom. While modeling is something we do quite often and, and literally everything that we do in the classroom is being modeled to students, we need to think really, really carefully about how we how we uh, model to ensure that students do exactly as we're asking for all the time. So let's go through um, an example. So I've got an example model over here. I, I see a couple of people have asked some questions about, can we have some examples? Here's an example that I've used in the past. So this talks about the idea of Newton's third law. Um, and Newton's third law tells us that when object A applies a force on object B, object B applies the same size force on object A, but in the opposite direction. So what this is, is a way, is, is a model, a model explanation for any situation regarding Newton's third law. And this is a, a point that I got to when I was teaching my key stage three or four classes, th key stage three and four classes about 10 years ago, um, where I thought, well, actually I can use this model time and time again. Um, it's been refined. It's been, I've looked at exam mark schemes just to make sure it gets the marks that are required over there. And actually it's been refined to, in terms of in the classroom first and foremost, so that students have a good understanding of what Newton's third law is actually about. So if I was to go through the ideas of modeling regarding this, the first thing that I do before delivering this model is really check the skinny parts of this. So, so I talk about what, um, what forces are actually about. So forces can be applied on objects. Forces can make objects change shape or they can make objects move. Uh, forces are measured in Newtons, but also they are vectors, so they have size and direction. So all of that is gonna become really important in this explanation. I then call my shots. So I say really, really clearly what I want students to pay attention to it in here. I want them to focus on the number of objects. So there's two objects within here, the number of forces. So there's two forces, the size of the forces. So we know the same, uh, the direction of the forces. And we know that they're opposite. So there's a lot for a student to hold in their mind. There. There's, there's four items and, and each of those has a caveat with it as well. So quite often to, to help with that load, I, I put this up on the board, get a student to list this on the board or get students to list those ideas in their book so they can use this when referring to this model. When I then start delivering this model, I'd, I'd model and describe each part of it. So when object A applies a force on object B, so I'd say, well, that's two objects, A and B, um, and A is applying a force on B, and then I'd pause there. Object B applies the same size force on object A. So B is also applying a force on A, so that's a second force now. Um, but those forces are exactly the same size. Um, so that's two objects, two forces, but they're on different objects, but the forces are of the same size. Um, and the final part is, but in the opposite direction. So the direction of the two forces is opposite. Um, so if one goes left, the other goes right. So what I've done there is I've used the model, but I've described each part of the model as I've gone through it. What that means is that it's it's easier for the students to understand why I'm going through this process of modeling, but also it's easier for students to therefore use this model afterwards. Supermodeling, so I'd supermodel as, as I do this. So not only is this an explanation for Newton's third law, but it goes through that precise process in which scientific explanations are, are, are written, that literally chunked step by step. Um, so I'm, I'm modeling an explanation for Newton's third law, but modeling a precise scientific explanation and how to clearly communicate those ideas. I'd also model the path. So at that point, I'd say, right, you've got this model now for Newton's third law. Let's go through it in this situation. So if I'm pushing against a wall, I apply a force on a wall of 25 Newtons. So I'm object A, I'm applying a force on the wall. The wall's object B, I apply a force of 25 Newtons. But object B, the wall, applies the same force back on me. Uh, of 25 newtons but in the opposite direction so i am pushing the wall to my left the wall is pushing me to my right okay so i model that explanation really clearly with the students so what that means is that not only have they understood the model but how to apply it as well after delivering the model I i'd insist students would walk this way so then i'd give them a variety of situations where i'd say right now i want you to apply this model to these situations but i want you to use the language exactly as I've used it in here, swap out the objects for the objects in the question or in the situation or in a scenario, swap out the size force for the actual size of the force, swap out the direction for the actual directions and make it explicitly clear. And then once students have this really clear model that they can apply in those situations, it becomes believable for them. 
And then when I show them that this can be used in an exam situation, they understand how this can lead to their greater success in future. After that, the whole idea of getting ready for my close up. So what I could do is record me going through this explanation or, or, or put it on a piece of paper that's projected and break it down step by step. What that means is that students can play that back or look back on it and check why that this is a, a successful model. And again, when going through the ideas of practice, they all come into play here. I, I'd, I'd encourage the fact that students need to use this explanation time and time again. And they might make mistakes. They might forget that the size of the force is the same. They might forget that the forces are in opposite direction. But that's fine as long as they keep coming back to that model. This is definitely one of the models that if students are practicing, that I need them to break down the barriers quite often. Because actually, it's a very simple model at the end of the day. It becomes one sentence that, that describes an awful lot of Newton's Ed law, pretty much all of it. So students practicing this, they'd say, well, actually, I've done it two or three times. I'm fine with it. But actually, it, it is something that gets wrong quite often. So that, that's what I go through with it. the idea of variety, changing the variety of scenarios to ensure that students understand that actually, yes, I need to be able to apply some variety of situations. Making it fun. Again, the scenarios can help with that. Again, just thinking of some random ones or think of some really interesting ones. So how photons hitting a, a solar sail can be, be a method of propulsion or there's a great old A-level exam question, I say old, I think it was only 10 years ago now, um, where there's a bacteria and it, and it fires out a liquid out of the back of it. And it talks about the idea of how that is a propulsion method for that, for that bacteria um, and how does Newton's third law actually apply to that. So that would actually make it a, a, a bit fun in terms of a, of a different scenario there outside of what we consider physics. Everybody does it, so I do it, I do it, and I do it on the board as well as all the students doing it. And again, this is a great one for peer-to-peer -peer accountability because they can read these um, model answers to each other and ensure that everyone's working the way that they can. And of course, as I mentioned before, praise uh, the actions that students are making, not just, I think someone asked about the difference between actions and traits. So I wouldn't say, oh, you know, you're always working hard. Thank you for continuing to work hard. I'd praise the actions. No, I'd say specifically what, what, what they've done. That's so good. That's great. I can see that you've practiced that explanation seven times. I can see that you've done it in seven different scenarios. That's brilliant. Rather than saying, well done on working hard or, or, or well done on engaging with the work, which, which is praising traits that someone actually has or, or surface level things rather than actually breaking it down to the absolute actions that students are taking. So when we're talking about modeling, um, in, in terms of curriculum conversations that leaders actually have uh, with each other regarding curriculum, I think Practice Perfect is a great book to start off with here. It, it, you know, what we really need to be doing is focusing on the effectiveness of modelling and practice within our curriculum, ensuring that it's making the difference that we want it to make. That we codify these ideas of what modelling and practice are. So yes, modelling and yes, practice are ideas that we know really, really well. But actually, are we getting the absolute maximum benefit out of these without considering each and every little step that takes part that takes place in it, which is exactly what Practice Perfect does. We need to make sure that when we model, we model in a way that's true to the subject. So I've used a very subject specific example in terms of physics within science. There, I know that model in that way or that way of modeling wouldn't work exactly the same in other subjects. So it's about taking taking apart that codified model that that I've uh, that I've that Lemov's put together there and then applying it to your subject area. And the same goes for practice as well. We need to ensure that feedback is effective because as I've mentioned within both the modeling process and the practice process, feedback is absolutely a crucial tool as part of it. So thank you very much. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Just going to have a look to see if there are any questions. And there's Flavia. Oh, I think you're muted, Flavia. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, there are plenty of questions. So thank you so much. That was really great, really important, I think, and very useful for lots of teachers. So there are questions here. So I'm going to type them back and then put them on the screen so that uh, everybody can see what you're answering to. So this is there's a couple of questions that I put together. So basically, how do we ensure we keep creativity within the modeling and how can we not model the flare out of the process? Uh, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that I'm being asked that as, uh, as, a, as a leader within a trust called the Creative Education Trust. And one of the things that we actually champion at, at the trust that they're working is this whole idea of creativity. I think what we need to what we need to do to do that is exactly what we've done with modeling, which is codify what actually we mean 
by um, what, what we actually mean by creativity. Now, for me, creativity is all about the connections made between areas of knowledge. Um, so if I know this, this area of knowledge well, and I know this area of knowledge well, how can I combine or connect these areas of knowledge into something new um, and therefore and therefore something that's creative. Um, so in terms of modeling, um, ensuring that we still keep creativity, if we think about a creative subject like art, if we model two or three simple ideas so that students understand in depth how they work, students can combine those areas of knowledge um, deeply to come up with something new. So it's about understanding what actually we mean, we mean by creativity. So as I mentioned, for me, creativity is all about knowledge connected and how we connect different areas of knowledge. Um, and therefore, if we go about modeling those individual silos particularly well, when students connect those bits of knowledge together, they can do it in a way that is creative. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think that is a very important question, definitely. Uh, so there was a big discussion on the comments about the difference between pre-recorded videos and live modeling. So people are arguing for both. So do you have any research evidence for one or the other? What's the pros and cons of each of them? Really interesting question. Um, I, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't looked into any major research on this. I, I think it's something that we need to consider and think about and, and think about the pros and cons in certain situations. Um, when, for me, as an educator, when I'm teaching students um, and I'm going through something that I want and that I want the focus of it to be a believable model that students will take away with them, I think if I pre-record it, students won't necessarily be able to see my entire thought process behind what I'm doing unless I keep pausing the video. If I'm going through it in person, say like with this explanation right now, I can show what underpins my thought. And I think that's the key with whether we want to go with a pre-recorded explanation or, or a live explanation. And, and for me, it's it's pretty much the same as do I want to provide students with a model that I'm just going to put up onto the board? That is almost like a pre-recorded one. That's the defined model. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop it and keep talking through it quite often. Or am I going to actually craft it with them over time? And I think either or is appropriate, but it's about thinking about the situation, what your students, what your students are going to gain from it, and, and actually what you want your students to gain from it. Is it that you've got complete buy-in, that they're going to be fine with any model that you're actually presenting them, or is it that you want to go through the process of creating models with them uh, as well? So a, 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 a really interesting, really interesting discussion, a really interesting area. I've, n I've not come across any research. I don't know if anyone else has. I'd be really interested to know if anyone else has, so please do, do, do tag me in it um, if you have. But for, for me, I think some people are saying they're misunderstood what we mean by pre-recorded. So pre-recorded, what I meant there was actually say you'd you put a paragraph up that you've that you've got, you've you've talked through an explanation and you put it on the board uh, and just played through that video. Or it could actually mean, as I just mentioned, you've got a a, a, a model that you've defined that you're just going to put onto the board and you're saying, right, students, we're going to read through this, we're going to understand that, and now we're going to use it. Uh, to be to be off. To be fair, I think what we often do as teachers is somewhere in between those two. You know, we, we have a model in our mind that we know works really, really well. So like the Newton third law one that I, that I had there. And depending on the level of need within the class, depending on how much I need to scaffold, I'll either really break it apart bit by bit, or I could actually just say, right, I'm sure you've understood the model now, guys. I can see that you're all automatically going to the process of practicing it. Let's go into practice to check that we know it and then come back to it afterwards. Yep, that's good. So there are a couple more questions that I put together here. They are kind of related to creativity, but I guess it's more about letting students also decide with you what they will be learning when you are developing the curriculum and modeling the curriculum. So how important is giving learning to students where is student voices and design and modeling? Yeah, re really, really, really important question. So um, I, I think th there's two sides to this, I think the design part of it and the model part of it. So if I, took, if I talk about the design part of the curriculum first, I think student voice is important and we need to consider um, the, the needs of our students, but we also need to ensure that whatever we're doing in that instance of designing a curriculum isn't diluting what we know the subject to be. Um, so we're ensuring that we know that certain things uh, have, uh, cer certain concepts within curriculum have, within curricular areas, have 
are, are huge almost portals or gateways into further learning and students without seeing the bigger picture won't necessarily understand that actually this core bit of knowledge is really important for everything else going forward so again leaning on my my science knowledge um if i'm talking about surface area to volume ratio students won't necessarily understand the importance of surface area to volume ratio until they've come across gas exchange until they come across diffusion until they've come across rates of reaction because it comes up time and time again um so if, if, if student voice is saying, well, actually, that, that doesn't seem like a particularly interesting part of the curriculum, why are we learning that? That doesn't mean that needs to be removed. However, I think student voice in terms of modelling is a really important idea here, because actually, what is the point of modelling? Well, modelling is, is being used to transmit information from the, the sender, us as a teacher, to the receiver, the students. And actually, if our model isn't getting that information across, we need to adjust our model. So maybe, maybe we need to put two or three models up sometimes, see how things work, see whether the, the level of craft, the, the show of the craft of the of the modeling needs to be shown to students and get to that point so that we know how we need to interact with our classes to ensure that our, our models are being delivered uh, and our explanations are being delivered to the students in the way we want them to be. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I have a few more questions. I probably won't have time to answer all of them, but there's one's a bit more on a practical sense. But if you would ever share something and then let students discuss in pairs or groups before going to modeling the explanation yeah that, that, that's, a, that's a really really good one actually um and it's something that i started that i when i i remember when i wrote this blog uh, and part of the reason why i chose to, to write about this so sorry to talk about this now it's because um it's, it's very much a start of a new year process for me i I'd normally go through the idea of right guys yeah you know, this is how i i'm going to model this explanation to you by the time I normally get halfway through a year, by the time all classes and students are used to me, I'm really, really lucky. I've had a, a class for six years um, that I've taken away through for A-level. I now get to a point where I can give them a scenario, I can give them a model, let them discuss to see how they think the model is relevant to the scenario. And they understand that they can't commit entirely to that to begin with. I think the thing to be wary of, of that approach is how could it lead to misconceptions building? Um, and if we just roll with that before we understand um, the importance of modelling within uh, within crafting an explanation, then misconceptions can build. So if, if we just get, hand it over to students and, and let them get to that point, sometimes they, they can develop a misconception from it. However, if they have a really good understanding of how actually models are going to be applied to scenarios because they've done it with you time and time again and practised it time and time again, they can get to a point where actually they, they don't need that that information anymore so it's it's a bit like that bacteria question that i mentioned in the presentation i've put that up a couple of times in my level lessons and i've said right guys you know you know the model here give it a go see what you come up with and then they come to a point of understanding uh, how to apply that model without me having to need to go through it every single time the other interesting thing is and this is going back to creativity if if students have come up with similar models for similar approaches they can see those similarity similarities so New, that Newton's Day law model and that bacteria question that I just discussed. Students have seen that I've taught over the years, the link between that and force is equal to change of momentum over time and, and how that bacteria question can be answered from both routes. So how it can be answered in terms of a, a change of momentum situation because, because of the conservation of momentum and, and the slime going one way and the bacteria going the other way, that's a bit like what well, the force is acting in opposite directions. So because of their understanding of that, they can apply both models and understand that both models are intrinsically linked so going back to the creativity point that just reminded me that actually i've, I've seen that happen in the past so the creativity uh, they've creatively made that link between those two areas which which is something that does exist so so yeah i, ha I have done it that way i think the thing to be wary of is misconceptions if we go about it that way around yep super i think we have time for one more so it is about um, captivating students' interest during the initial explanation. Right. So, and how do you, you have scripts regarding how uh, the model will help in exam success? So, modeling to to captivate interest uh, is an interesting idea. I think I, I don't necessarily jump straight for the model to do that. I, I usually have a bigger question to show how this is relevant to what we are learning right now or what we've already learned. Or, or what we're going to learn. So, so I'd almost have a, a, a bigger question that I'd ask that would zoom down to this model afterwards. And, and that's how I'd 
captivate people interest in, through a curricular lens to begin with. Um, and in terms of scripts regarding how uh, the model will help with exam success, usually what I do is I will have um, a question that is that the model can be directly applied to. So I'll, I'll go back to that bacteria and slime question again. That one sits in the background every single time I, I, I come across this model that I then pull out and say, right, now apply it to this situation. Let's have a look at the mark scheme. Can you see how this model allows you to knock X, Y, and Z marks off the mark scheme? So not only can they see how it helps them understand the situation, they can also see how, they, how it allows them to uh, be successful in assessment situations as well. Yep, that's fantastic. Okay, so uh, I think we ran out of time, unfortunately. There are other questions. So uh, yeah, feel free to, if you wanna, just go back on the chat and try to answer people uh, on the chat if you want. But thank you so much. Do you wanna give people again uh, your contact information if they wanna get yeah. in touch with you again? Yep, yeah, so on Twitter, it's just at nlad84 and uh, the, the blogs on these two areas uh, again, the links on my on my Twitter profile. So feel free to do have a to have a look. But so thank you very much for for having me, Flavia. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And great to see so many educators here, especially in the summer holidays. Yep, <laughs> yeah, very dedicated <laughs> teachers. So thank you all so much, and thank you, Nimish, very much. They were great questions. Uh, so now we're gonna have a four minute break. Let's just wait until four fifty. Just anybody needs to take a very quick break, and then we will get back with Mary for her talk. So see you later, see you in a minute. In the meantime, let me remind you that we can use hashtag SenecaCPG if you wanna ask anything or make any comments on Twitter, that's the best way. Make sure that you tag our speaker, so Adonimish or Mary, to share your comments so we can keep learning even more even after the conference is over. Uh, also, for just do what you did, but do even more for Mary. So type your comments, type your questions. There was a really nice discussion about the whole video or live modeling on the comments. So keep doing that during Mary's talk, ask her questions so that she can answer them in the end. And yeah, that's basically it. Feel free to share everything on Twitter ask your questions on the chat. And uh, also just some announcements. So you know that Seneca provides free CPD. We has been doing it for years now. Uh, so we're starting again with conferences. So this is just an appetizer. It's a mini conference, but we're gonna have bigger conferences in September once you're back from the holidays. So we already have a really great lineup of speakers confirmed. So they will be coming in September. They will all be online. So you can join from your house, from your school, wherever you want free to attend, so it's a great opportunity for you. And we're also working on some new CPD courses online. And we're working with some really big, amazing names, such as Tom Sherrington, for example. So we're gonna have a course about his, uh, the Learning Forest model. So, and we have a course coming also on, based on Mark and Zoe answer. We have one on Nimish, actually, yeah, I forgot to say that. So we're gonna have a course based on Nimish's book as well. So there are a lot of things coming up on Seneca. They're all free and they're all available for you. So make sure you go on our website, make sure you follow us on Twitter. Uh, also, my name is Flavia. I didn't, I realized I didn't introduce myself in the beginning, but I'm Flavia and I'm the chief scientist at Seneca. So yeah, feel free to ask me if you have any questions or anything about any of the CPD you have. I'm just gonna let, you see our Twitter handle again. So that is at Seneca Learn. You can just follow us and you'll be informed of all the new CPD opportunities. And then our website is SenecaLearning.com, also available for you to sign up for free and have access to all the amazing CPD that we do. Okay, so I put Mary on the screen now. Uh, do you wanna, just so we can practice, start sharing your screen before we still have a minute, but just to get things ready. That's great. A brilliant session there from Nimish. Just making lots of notes. 
Just checking you can see that. Um, mm, it's black. Let's just try it again. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's better. Did it come through? Yes, but yeah, if you put it on presentation mode, it should work now. Yeah. Uh, oh no, now it's black again. Right. Um, okay, we still have a minute, we'll figure out. So I'm trying to get it to play from the start. I'll stop the share and come in again, I think. Okay. So is that coming through? Yeah, all the small slides, we can see them. Yeah. I think last time you had your second screen on and that helped. I don't know if you have it there. I can try that. Yeah, because that's what we did last time. Sorry, everybody, just a uh, couple problems. Yeah, but we'll be done in a minute. Okay. Uh, I'm on the other screen as well. Yeah, maybe uh, if you stop sharing and then start sharing again now with the other screen, that could be better. Yes, there you go. Brilliant. All working, all good to go. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, sorry about that, colleagues. So at least it's coming through now. So many apologies for anyone who's uh, uh, was getting fed up with that. Uh, anyway, great to have the chance to have a chat with you about uh, some thoughts on the curriculum. Um, I think the work that Seneca Learning does is just amazing. And uh, the work that Flavia does, you just bring so many people with you, Flavia. It's just tremendous. Um, and so I'm delighted to be part of this this afternoon, talking about five caveats for the curriculum. Um, so before we get into it, I just think it's worth um, running through the headlines of some curriculum principles before we get into some things that I think might be um, might need to be tightened up or where we might be focusing slightly on the wrong things. Um, so the first is that we need to be asking ourselves that whatever we offer our pupils and students in whatever phase is ambitious, sufficiently ambitious for all our pupils and students, regardless of their starting points. Um, so one of the things I've noticed is that there's um, a lot of uh, rhetoric, a lot of hyperbole around ambition, um, but actually there's sometimes a bit of drift between what is said on um, plans and on websites and actually then what gets translated into practice. So we just need to make sure that everything we do, if we're buying into the idea of ambition, which I think is a really good one, uh, that it's reflected in everything that we do through to the resources that are offered to our pupils and students in whatever phase to the expectations that we have of them. And I think that also need, leads to the uh, quality of what we offer our children as well. But instead of this just being a piece of um, rhetoric, what is it that our pupils um, say? So pupil and student voice is a 
big thread of my work. And um, both in primary and secondary, we've got pupils saying that they really enjoy demanding work. Um, so we can have this from both ends, both from what the sector is saying is important. It's also sitting there in the latest framework and handbook, but we've also got this from children as well. So um, I think there can sometimes be a bit of a tendency to make things too easy for some of our children in the mistaken belief they can't cope um, when in fact they can. And so not to put any limits on children's learning because um, it doesn't do them any good, but actually uh, they, they say that they want it as long as they have appropriate support. Um, so I got a quick example from secondary and one from primary. So from secondary, I was doing a piece of work before lockdown um, in a school in London, very high performing school. But I was asked um, by the school to talk to some students that they'd identified as being high prior attaining, but underachieving, um, able but idle one or two of those knocking about the system out there. And um, so I sat down and I spoke to this group of students. There were six of them. Um, they were year nines and they happened to be all boys. And I said, is there any subject in this school where you're not mucking about? Because they weren't learning, but they were stopping others from learning as well. And that's what I wanted to tease out. And in this school, they said it was geography. So I said, well, tell me what's going on in geography then. That means you're doing your best work and you're letting others get on and do theirs as well. And they said, well, our teacher just gives us really demanding difficult stuff to read to discuss and then to do something with and so for homework for example she'll give us articles to read from professional geographical uh, publications and what she says to us is your job for homework is to read this now you're not going to understand it all but that's all right because at the start of the next lesson we're going to talk about what you did understand and what you didn't understand um um, and they, they were just thrilled with this. They said, sometimes we get material that be used in universities, don't you know? They, I mean, they were quivering with excitement. Now, I was in that teacher's classroom later that day um, with these students in there, mixed prior attainment, and she had the same high expectations for all the students, regardless of their starting points. And when I checked the results for geography in that school, they were the highest by a margin in a very high performing school, similarly nationally. Now, that teacher didn't give those students difficult, demanding work above their pay grade in order to get great results. The great results follow from them being given difficult, demanding work with appropriate support. It's that way around. Um, and then a quick example from primary, from Alison Peacock's work, um, her great book, um, assessment for Learning Without Limits, which came out in 2015, when she and a colleague are talking to some children as they go from year five into year six, they're trying to find out what children think of ability tables. And um, But actually, the children's responses are about the level of work they're, they're given. So the ones on the top tables, they love it. They enjoyed being special ones and having special challenges set by the teacher. The middle group um, are annoyed they don't get the same demanding work as the others. They like the sound of it, but they realize they're never going to get the chance because there are only six seats on the top table. And then the, the bottom tables um, are affected the worst. They feel dumb. They feel useless. And they love the sound of some of the challenges the top group had, but they know they're never going to get the chance. So what we've got going on here is um, um, misapplied uh, kindness to children thinking that they can't cope when in fact they want the chance to have a go with appropriate support and the way to do it in my view is not differentiated colored worksheets as they're just going to widen gaps so what's sitting underneath this notion of ambition both from a strategic level and then also from a child level is the idea that they like the high challenge but it has to be accompanied by low threat they need to know they're going to be supported and i'm arguing that the the, the greatest way to support and scaffold is primarily through talk and through modeling, which we've just heard um, from Nimish's session. Um, so a couple of examples then of what, um, both from primary and secondary, of what happens when we give children really difficult demanding work. And the first example is from um, history. This is year seven, a brilliant um, historian and senior leader, Richard Kennett, do follow him on the Twitters. And he's teaching this year seven class about uh, the Norman Conquest. And so what's he given them for homework? 
He says he's tested out the scholarship reading homework. How cool is that scholarship reading homework for the year seven guinea pig class? Every student could access it, even those with a reading age below 10. Clearly, we need to have higher expectations of these children. So um, they've been learning about the Norman Conquest. And what Richard has given them is um, ex extracts from Mark Morris's account of the Norman Conquest. Mark Morris, as I'm sure you know, is a world-renowned historian. It's not a dumbed-down, guided um, uh, level reading. It's 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 serious stuff. But what Richard says is, the homework, read these two pages and answer all the questions. But then he flags it up. He says, this is supposed to be hard. That's the high challenge. So if you can't answer all the questions, don't worry. He takes that threat away. It's low threat. And as a result of that, he gets every child contributing, even those with a with a, 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 a low prior attainment. Um, and when I talked to Richard about why he was offering them this rich material, he said, well, in lessons when we're learning about the Norman Conquest, I'm using extracts from, extracts from Simon Shamer's work, um, another world class historian. What I want my children understanding is that while there might be historical events that are uncontested, Historians disagree about the significance and um, impact and consequences of those. He's taken them into a really deep space from right, right from the start of secondary. Next example quickly is from primary. This is from Ashley Booth, Mr. Booth, year six. If you're on the Twitter, it's well worth following as well. Why do I love whole class reading so much? Because a child would have long been considered low ability in inverted commas can access texts like I know why the cage bird sings by Maya Angelou along with their peers and subsequently that great educational term bang out stuff like this. So this child has clearly been supported that's great um, but it is their own voice their own ideas that are coming through. Um, they're making the connection between the conditions for the bird in the cage in the novel, which was written in 1960, and with conditions for a large proportion of black American society in the States in the 1960s. Very sensitive, very poignant stuff, and sadly still a live issue today. Um, but the point here is that child would not have been able to have those insights to draw those um, out, to articulate them, if this text had not been made available to them because someone had thought that they couldn't cope. Um, so this thread of ambition coming through to the materials that we offer our children. And we've got this from um, Ofsted School Inspection Update from a couple of years ago. It's a matter of social justice, which I absolutely agree with, which is why I'm quoting this here. It's profoundly important to make sure that all pupils receive a high quality education built around an ambitious, well-designed and well-sequenced curriculum. This is a matter of social justice and equity because, it, because it's the most disadvantaged children, I would say for the most part, because not all disadvantaged children uh, are, dis are disadvantaged um, cognitively, intellectually, well, they most certainly aren't, but they haven't had necessarily all the same things available to them as other children, but it's not a universal, okay? Plenty of our disadvantaged children are absolutely fine. But we know a higher proportion of them, um, if they're disadvantaged, they're most likely to miss out on the things that a strong curriculum supplies. It is they who are more likely than their peers not to hear the rich vocabulary and encounter the concepts that this vocabulary communicates. We've got some important ideas there that I'm just going to pick up um, for a moment. Um, but at the heart of this, when we offer children demanding work, um, they tell us that they relish it. And there's feedback along the lines of, well, we like being made to feel clever. And I think it's my job as an educator is to make the children in my class feel clever. And I'm going to do that if I give them rich demanding stuff. So I've um, produced quite a bit more about this notion of ambition and the way that we talk about our subjects and um, how that flows through uh, to thinking about the curriculum um, on a free um, piece of work on Myatt and Co, thinking about curriculum intent, where I have expanded on that. So that is the first um, uh, principle I think we need to be mindful of, <clears throat> ambition. And whether the work we're offering our children and the way we frame our curriculum is truly ambitious, are we just paying lip service to it and chucking a few words in? It's got to be lived, can't just be laminated on the website. 
The second principle, I believe, is that it needs to contain the big ideas. And uh, we've already seen before um, uh, this one where it talks about the rich vocabulary and encounter the concepts. All right. So it's the concepts that are kind of the big boulders of the curriculum uh, that we need to be making sure that whatever we're teaching is linked to a big concept. And I'm just going to unpack that a bit. Uh, we've got some helpful insights from um, the field of cognitive science, um, which can give us some clues, which we take in the spirit of best bets, um, as Dylan William calls it, that you know, some of these insights might be helpful in our settings and in our classrooms, in which case, why wouldn't we incorporate them? Um, but I think the other thing to say about the findings from cognitive science and a lot of the evidence, an awful lot of it is common sense, isn't it? Did we really need cognitive science to tell us some of this stuff? It's just useful to have had some wider research done around it. So I'm going to be calling here on Dan Willingham's work, Why Don't Students Like School? Um, uh, which is just updated in the last uh, few weeks or so ago, where he talks about the importance of concepts. Um, that our children are going to know more and remember more if we've identified the concepts and the big ideas. So why are they so helpful? Well, they act as kind of holding baskets for a lot of information. So if I understand a concept, it means that new knowledge related to that concept is going to be much stickier. Um, and um, the other thing about them is that the concepts, the big ideas, also contain the tier three vocabulary that we're really keen to um, develop in our children. Um, the tier three vocabulary, the conceptual vocabulary, um, are really like um, a golden chest that opens up into the landscape of individual subjects. Now, sometimes they traverse subjects, but a lot of them are residing with individual subjects. So when our children really have purchase on them, um, they're going to be able to go deeper. But this idea of the concepts and the big ideas, uh, the, the great thing is there's plenty of them, but there aren't too many. So we pull out the ones that have got going to have most traction um, in terms of our children's learning. Um, so we've got this wonderful tier three vocabulary we can then do a bit of playfulness with it going back into the roots of the words kids love doing this we might also pull out um those big words those big ideas for instance on a knowledge organizer um really making sure that our children understand this are fluent in them by the end of the unit this is an example from the Michaela school joe kirby's work from several years ago on a history unit on apartheid um a quick example here from one that i produced on the first book of creation in the first book of Genesis for a separate piece of work I've done. I want my children to know this rich, beautiful stuff um, fluently in their, uh, deep in their DNA. So I've done um, more extensive work on that, extracting real value, but also some of the caveats that there are around knowledge organizers. They're not a universally good thing if they have been badly applied, like stuck in kids' books and never used. Um, so we've also got this um, coming through from um, Stephen Pinker, uh, another world-renowned um, cognitive scientist who says, cognitive psychology has shown that the mind best understands facts when they're woven into a conceptual fabric, such as a narrative, a mental map or intuitive theory. Disconnected facts are like unlinked pages on the web. They're like unlinked pages on the web. They might as well not exist. So this is where this idea of coherence and sequencing and drawing on prior knowledge and um, foregrounding future work where appropriate um, is so helpful based on these insights. Um, so one of the things that we need to be thinking about beyond ambition, identifying the big ideas is helping our pupils and students to know more and remember more. Um, it's a statement of the obvious, really, isn't it? But it's like um it is it is really important otherwise we might as well just all pack up and go home if we just think it's about delivering a curriculum uh, it's much more than that we need to be thinking about how our children know more and remember more over time um so underpinning with this notion of ambition again from dan willingham it's well-known insight for me it's one of the most helpful insights into curriculum thinking is that our brains privilege story we know more and remember more if we've heard it in a story. And when Dan's talking about 
um, stories. He's not just talking about novels or fairy tales. He's talking about any high quality text that has a narrative element to it. And I would um, also include poetry in this. I would also include um, pictures and art, um, picture books as well. Uh, we read those and we gain information from them. To go back to Pinker again, <clears throat> he talks about cognitive psychology showing the mind best understands, understands facts when they're woven into a conceptual fabric such as a narrative, a mental map or intuitive theory. Um, disconnected facts in the mind are like unlinked pages on the web. They might as well not exist. All right, they might as well not exist. I just find this so powerful. Um, so for me, you know, let's get cracking on high quality text. We also have this finally from uh, Marianne Wolf's work, um, Proust and the Squid, the story and science of the reading brain that human beings invented reading only a few thousand years ago. With this invention, we rearranged the very organization of our brain, which in turn expanded the ways we were able to think, which altered the intellectual evolution of our species. So I take from this is that both um, society, um, took a huge leap when writing and reading were invented um, about 5,000 years ago, but that reading makes us intelligent, more intelligent as human beings and as, as, and as individuals. So stories matter because they create the big picture, what Christine Council calls the hinterland. We know more and remember more if we know some background to it. So a, the great thing about a high quality text is gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting. They contain a lot of those complex ideas, right? Um, the, the, the concepts, a well-chosen text will do that. They enrich children's vocabulary because the written word by and large is more sophisticated than the spoken word, um, even of classrooms. And so we want children to um, be exposed to language of greater lexical depth and complexity. They need to, to experience it, they need to have it. And then there's plenty of evidence. I don't have time to go into it on this session. They're inclusive for all, right? So why would we, why would we not use high quality texts as one of our principles for the curriculum? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why we don't. <laughs> it just seems to be a statement of the obvious if we take this, these insights seriously. So I love this text from Andy Tharby, brilliant English leader um, uh, and part of the um, research team at the Durrington Research School. He talks about the text being the beating heart of the lesson. The text is the beating heart of the lesson. The argument I make is that there's, there are appropriate texts for every topic at every key stage in every subject if we know where to look for them. Um, let's remind ourselves our children want demanding work uh, they like doing this stuff and that um, we need to just have a handful of criteria the visuals have got to be great why would I show my children stuff that is not absolutely exquisite the tone has got to talk to them as though they're intelligent human beings I don't need the pupils in my class to be patronized thank you very much and they need to have this rich vocabulary so um and then finally, they need to, um, we need to be drawing on authentic sources to bring all this together, whether it's text, whether it's high quality materials. Most of what's downloaded from the internodal is not worth the paper it's printed on. Um, about 90% of it is an absolute joke. All right, I'm happy to have people challenge me on that. Um, so I've pulled together on uh, my website, marymart.com. If you go to resources, I've got um, links for every subject that get us to that. Um, authentic, demanding, challenging space that doesn't dam down for children. Okay, so those are the principles then. Let's turn now to the five caveats. Um, so these are just observations on um, conversations I've been having with colleagues, um, uh, particularly over the last 18 months or so. So one is, is that there is this idea in many parts of the sector that we really can't get going until all our ducks are in a row. It's like, yeah, but beginning is half done, as, as Churchill said. So we need to have enough in place. We need to know that whatever we're teaching, where it sits within a wider unit, we need ideally in whatever part of the sector we're sitting in to have a sense of our subject that we're teaching, whether it's in primary or secondary, 
um, or indeed in special schools, what the what the overall picture is three to nineteen, not in detail, but what is the overall uh, overarching narrative of this subject? And then as I'm teaching this bit, where might it link to that? And if it doesn't link in any way, I've got questions about whether I should be doing it. Um, but this idea that we've got to wait until everything is perfect, you know, just get cracking. Nobody's going to die if, you know, something doesn't go quite as slickly as we want to. We just refine it. So I'm just a bit concerned that um, quite a few of the colleagues I'm talking to say, well, we just want to keep working on the plans. No, you've got some good ideas. Just just start using them. Start building it as you go. Um, the second is... Um, the idea that the plans, I put it plans versus pupils. But I'm also picking up, and I have done for quite a long time, that um, the plans are more important than the pupils in front of us. Now, it doesn't, that people don't exactly say that, but that's actually what's happening when they say, well, it's on the plan, therefore I've done it this lesson. That That's it, they're not going to get it again. Yeah, but the pupils haven't got it, so why are you going on? Well, the plan says so. Yet the plans are never important than the pupils in front of us. End of. Right. Living human little people in front of us, we should be getting it right for them, not ticking it off on, on plans. All right, there's a temptation because, you know, we want to be seen to be doing our job by ticking some of this stuff off. But the proof of the pudding is whether our children have got it or not. Um, but then the converse is true as well. Sometimes our children might have grasped something more swiftly than we had anticipated. So we move on. All right. It's all about the responsive teaching um, that's live in the lesson that gives me the clues as to whether I should be moving on or whether I should be digging deeper and lingering longer. Um, then the next thing is the curse of content coverage. Um, if we if we if we're really true to the idea of the big ideas, the concepts, then we select the material that is going to bring those concepts alive. All right. There is this idea that there's masses and masses to cover. But if you look at the national curriculum beyond English, maths and science in primary, where it's set out each year for what needs to be taught. Um, beyond that, the other subjects you look at the programmes of study, apart from history, because Michael Gove got his mitts on that, but the rest of them, I don't think they're overloaded. And we've got up to four years to teach them in key stage through, uh, two, three years in key stage three. So when we get to key stage four, there is a lot of stuff to cover because um, expectations are higher. Um, uh, there's more content to cover. That, the, However, that is not a, an excuse to carve out time in key stage three. Key stage three is a separate entitlement. OK, um, so what we do is we think about key stage three as the intellectual powerhouse for the school, for the secondary for the secondary phase, because if we've identified the big concepts that they're likely to need at key stage four, if they continue to follow that subject, if it's um, an option and if it's one of the core that they're going to need as well, We'll make sure that we've spent time doing that at key stage three. It's not that we draw down the content, we draw down and make sure that those concepts are there. Um, but this idea we've got to keep throwing stuff at kids and the hope that some of it's going to stick, what I call Jackson Pollocking the curriculum. Uh, we've got to stop doing it, co uh, colleagues. All right. Covering the content does not mean my children have learned it. Next one is turning pupils green. Key performance, key performance indicators. Yeah, I've got to turn them green. This is quite often I'm picking this up in primary schools. So we're desperate for evidence. Got to rethink um, how we think about progress. All right. It's not this sort of nonsense, which um, Jamie Pembroke put, picked up earlier on this year. You know, the, the worry with this kind of turning children green is that um, <clears throat> it's a complete and utter waste of time for the poor teachers, you know, Stop it. Stop it. But the e even bigger concern is you get a backwash into the curriculum as people strive to meet these nonsense mini KPIs, complete and utter nonsense. So we've got to rethink progress and we need to be rethinking evidence about the things that children might produce that give us insights 
rather than ticking off KPIs as to whether our children might have it. So this in, this idea of um, uh, production, I think is a really helpful one. Um, I meant to put the quote in from Tim Oates, who led on the review of the national curriculum. He said that um, we, we've got some insights as to whether our children know what we've intended them to by the things that they produce. That's a really helpful insight. So what are children producing? Well, there could be there are spoken responses, because frankly, if a child can't do can't either do something or explain what I've taught them, I haven't taught them. So that's a that's a basic insight. Some extended writing would be an insight. Some low stakes quizzes can give us that. And it could be some other stuff like, you know, we've only got to look at Austin's butterfly to see whether the child has made progress or not. Anyone looking at that should be able to make a judgment about whether the child's made progress or not. If they can't, they shouldn't be doing the job. Um, so just going to the richness of the works, we've got um, lovely examples here, which I think are a great opportunity for some units um, in, in primary. And I think they can go into key stage three as well. This is Paul Watson's work. Um, it's evident here whether our children's um, learning has really come through. Just a few examples there. And uh, Paul has done a brilliant um, session on that uh, on Myat and Co, how he's gone about that. OK, so to wrap this up, colleagues, so we've got time for questions. Um, don't let's wait until all our ducks in a row are in a row. Let's, let's just get cracking. Uh, being prepared to adjust our plans in light of children's responses, not feeling that we've got to chuck everything at it and cover everything in the hope that some of it's going to stick. Let's stop turning our pupils green on those KPIs. And then finally, let's buy into this idea that the curriculum is a never ending story. So all my work is in draft and work in progress, right? Because I want people coming back to me and say, this would be a better resource, Mary, or this would be a better way of doing it. I don't ever want it to be a finished product. And I'm just going to finish by saying that um, Andrew Percival, brilliant deputy head and done masses on the curriculum, deputy head in the school in Oldham, he talks about creating a curriculum culture in his school, a curriculum culture, where it's just talked about the whole time. Why? Because it's absolutely riveting. So pupils deserve beautiful stuff that makes them think. They're going to know more and remember more. And let's Remember, as we go about our work, colleagues, we're human beings first. You know, let's breathe into this. Don't let's put ourselves under too much pressure. We're human beings first. We're professionals second. The young people we're working are human beings first and their learners second. Thank you. I hope that has been helpful. See if I can stop the share now. Thanks, colleagues. I was talking on muted. Thank you so much. That was really great. Uh, I love all the quotes and all the things that are supposed to be obvious, but they are not really. So thank you so much. There are lots of questions. So um, I'm going to start with this one because I am I think that that's something that lots of teachers would feel. So oops, there you are. So mostly about time constraints. So where do I look for high quality text? I know a high quality text when I see it, but time constraints mean that I pay, I paid out good stuff with the easy to download texts. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm going to be doing some sessions on this for Martin Co. because I'm getting a lot of people asking me this. Um, I refer to, I refer to a lot. Um, I've got I've got plenty of examples. So, for instance, I don't know where that question came from, whether it's primary or secondary, but I'm going to give a quick example from primary science year six. Um, the program study talks about um, children being taught about um, evolution in year six science. Yeah. So if I'm underpinning that with a high quality text, I'm going to go to Sabina Radeva's wonderful book um, on Charles Darwin's on the origin of um, species. Um, why am I going to turn to that text? Well, because Sabina trained as a scientist and then she retrained as an artist. I know that the information is going to be really accurate. The images are sensational. They're going to provoke my children's curiosity. 
Um, the text talks to them as though they're intelligent human beings. It doesn't patronize them. And it's got it's laden with this beautiful vocabulary. Um, so uh, that is one example. And I, I have done a session on that on Martin Co um, using text in in science. But actually, there's a bigger piece of work which is coming out of the work I've been doing with schools um, on selecting those texts for each for those parts of the curriculum where we want children to know more and remember more. So it doesn't replace everything. It's not the driver for everything, because for geography, for instance, I want my children out and about and practicing um, map reading skills and orienteering and that sort of thing and, and field trips and stuff. But the stuff where I want them to know, I want them to know is going to be done through a high quality text. So, um, uh, you know, so the question is saying, I know high quality is when I see it, but time constraints. All right. So it's really helpful, the the the, fr the framework and the handbook, not that we're running our schools for Ofsted, we're running them for our pupils and students. Um, but it talks about, in the implementation part, it talks about teachers having good subject knowledge, right? And where they haven't got good subject knowledge, which is basically everyone in the sector, me included, we all need to bump up our subject knowledge, leaders are put in place appropriate support. Leaders are put in. So, so it's never a blame game, but we've got to start cutting out the stuff that doesn't add value to learning. I've got my hit list. <laughs> marking. Marking is a complete not a waste of yep. time. Virtually all of it. OK, I'm not saying we never mark, but virtually all of it. Got to stop this nonsense. Putting in dodgy data every two minutes and then. Um, preparing half a dozen differentiated colored worksheets that are going to widen gaps. We've got to nail this nonsense. It's not adding value. And with that time, we can then um, read some books. So I was talking to a colleague yesterday. Sorry, this is turning into an extended answer. But I was talking to a curriculum lead in a primary school yesterday. We just recorded the most wonderful interview for Martin Go, And he said that just the excitement in his primary school um, uh, as, as the teachers read a text together. How are we going to use this? You know, people get excited and we've got lots of we've got lots of secondary schools where they're using their faculty and department meetings for this kind of work. OK. Yep. No, that's that's that is a good question. And I'm just going to remind everybody that Seneca marks for you. So our software does all the marking for you. So you have more time to do all of the other things that Mary is suggesting. It's just a really? tiny thing. OK, so uh, next question. What would be the best way to implement maybe a sitting plan for mixed ability class? It's not exactly related to curriculum, but it has to do with the yeah. differentiation that you were talking about. Yeah, so um, I mean, there are lots of different models. I mean, in primary, um, I mean, Shirley Clark's work, um, and, and she's done a huge amount with Dylan William and, and John Hattie. Um, uh, she's led a number of projects and, and then it's been, you know, implemented in many, many classrooms where um, the children are moved on a regular basis. Um, so they're not just sitting with the same people. So it's going to be about thinking, you know, if I'm a teacher and I've noticed um, that the previous lesson, there's about four or five children who are stuck on an element, I'm, I probably want to plot them together. So I can spend five minutes or whatever it takes to go through that and the rest of the class maybe working with a teaching assistant if I'm lucky enough to have one. Um, but as a strategy, knowing that children are going to be moved is a good thing, um, I think. Um, and that sometimes there, you see that um, ability isn't fixed. And I don't think we should be talking about ability. We should be talking about prior attainment. But you could have an early grasper in maths, you know, just like this, but actually they struggle on one bit. They're not an early grasper in that bit, so it's all very fluid. Um, but that you get the, you're, there are going to be occasions where you want a child who might be more articulate than another working with a white or sitting next to another. Um, so I think it um, it's well worth paying attention to, and it's well worth um, reading Shirley Clark's work on that. Yeah, it's always good to have more reading. <laughs> um, so next question. How can we encourage learners to aim more and be more ambitious if they are finding, that's a more for this year question, if they are finding remote learning itself already challenging? Yeah, and I've got a lot of sympathy with this because the remoteness 
is definitely a barrier. I mean, it's also got some great benefits as well. You know, like it's it's opened up professional learning, this sort of exercise. But for uh, and it's been great for a lot of children. But for many, where there's a lack of Wi-Fi access, a lack of, um, you know, just devices, um, it is tough. It's really tough. But if we're assuming from this question that, um, you know, the, the pupils or the students in the class, they are online, but they're finding already challenging. Um, it's about checking for understanding um, and making sure we're carrying our pupils with us. And so I think there's been lots of great work around chats and that sort of thing, just um, and low stakes quizzes and testing. But we bring we bring them with us. Um, but I would say it's not about telling our pupils or students to be ambitious. It's about offering them rich material, which we then unpack with them is, is the argument I would make. And, and obviously needing to slow it down where stuff is still going um, online, sadly. Yeah, uh, that is true. Uh, there are a few questions here about video. Sorry, I missed it. About video. So you talked a lot about text and how important reading is. But they're also asking about videos, if all of this could be also used uh, with videos instead of reading texts. Sorry, I just missed. Yeah, I think, I think videos are already well used for the most part in the sector. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it could do. I think the thing, though, is if you've just got it orally, you're having to concentrate more. Um, I also think something happens when we read aloud with a class. It doesn't happen every time. It's what Claire Seely, who was a head in Hackney and is now in charge of school improvement in Guernsey, absolutely brilliant. She, she says it's the collective cuddle. And we all kind of recognise that, don't we? Something happens to the atmosphere. Not every time, but it does happen. Um, and I don't really... Think, and that's because you've got everyone concentrating, everyone drawn into this rich stuff. And I don't think you get the same thing from a video. I'm not saying don't use videos, but I do think texts are under are underutilized. The schools that really get this, um, so I was talking to a colleague um, a few months or so ago, and he said a secondary school in science um, across the school, including his subject, they read a minimum of 800 words every lesson, 800 words every lesson you know, just boom. Um, but we've got large parts of the sector saying, oh, we're just reading. We're just reading. God, you've got to wash our mouths out. We're not just reading. <laughs> we're getting to the heart of this rich stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have time for maybe a couple more. So this is, I guess, one particular school, but I guess it applies to lots of schools. So how do you deal with the different gaps when kids come from different schools to your school. Yeah, and so this is at the heart of, um, you know, uh, formative assessment, really, that I, I, I find out where my pupils and students are, and then um, I adjust my teaching in the light of that. Um, now, there's nothing we can do about, I mean, if the gaps are related to um, decoding phonics you know they need additional support that needs to be in place really quickly so they can access the curriculum ditto with mathematics um but i don't think it's the end of the world if um if they do have some gaps if we taught those to um before in earlier years then we can just give some summaries to to those students um and again if we if we hold that within a high quality text, it makes it easier to refer back to, to other material. Um, but for, for the most part, I think it's mainly maths and um, science that need those building blocks. The rest, I think, you know, we can make up quite quickly in the other subjects. I'm not saying it's easy, but I do think it's possible. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna put two of another one together because they're both about target groups. So one about English as second language students and the other one about sound learners. If you have any yeah. suggestions or any tips to work with those groups. Okay, so to take um, uh, students with English as an additional language first, 
um, we we learn primarily through through hearing stuff, right? So the more they're exposed to, the better, all right? And then pausing um, to check for understanding, the use of pictograms, um, the use of diagrams, um, asking them to um, say some of the words back in their own language, that's going to deepen engagement. But um, yeah, the more they hear, and they don't need to understand every word, the better it's going to be for them. Um, to take the second one, um, students with additional needs, reading to the student, is it reading to the students as useful as the students working to read it themselves as a group? Okay, so there's two things going on here. One is, and I'm picking this up quite a lot, um, it's really important that um, those children who need additional support at whatever, whatever phase in the sector, that um, they have that additional support, which is often related to uh, decoding, phonics, SPAG, and leveled readers. So that is all necessary, but it's not sufficient. So if we just leave our children who are have got lower starting points or additional needs just with that provision, we're never going to close the gaps, ever going to close those gaps. So they need to be read to above their pay grade. Every, every child does, regardless of their starting points. There's lots of evidence around that. But I am talking to quite a few colleagues saying, well, um, they can't get onto that until they can read it. No nonsense until they can read it themselves. OK, our oral comprehension and understanding is far more developed than our visual comprehension, particularly when we're novice learners. Um, Edie Hirsch has done some great work on that, but it's been replicated elsewhere as well. Yeah, that's good. So I think let's do one more and then uh, it's probably be time for us to go. So are stories contextual examples? How can we use stories in teaching abstract subjects that may be content heavy, like some science subjects? Okay, so um, Carla Ravelli, 10 Lessons in Physics. Um, uh, I've already mentioned um, Sabrina Radeva's, uh, Richard Feynman's um, lessons in physics. What you find with these phenomenally brilliant scientists, <laughs> they don't get clogged up in making things any more complicated than they need to be. They're beautiful lyrical pieces. Um, ben Gordon has done um, a, a, a science senior leader. I can't remember where he is, um, but. Uh, uh, unpacking big ideas in science. There's lots out there. Um, and so, yeah, the abstract subjects that can be content heavy, like science, most definitely. But it's our job to identify and locate those. Um, and as I say, um, I'm going to be preparing more materials to support this work in schools. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mary. I think we Needs to, be done. needs to be done now. But thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if Nimish is still there. You can put him back online. But thank you so much. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. And I think everybody enjoyed it as well. Oh, there is Nimish. Let me just put him back on the thing. Okay, so uh, just thank you everybody who joined. Go on our website, go on SenecaLearning.com, follow us on at SenecaLearn because we'll be having more of those uh, conferences in September after the break. I hope you all enjoy your summer break. And thank you so much to everybody who stayed, who asked questions, who interacted with us. This video is already being recorded. So the same link that you used to access now is going to be the video later. So you can watch it at any time. If you, that's just a tip, but if you like the video, if you give it a thumbs up, then it gets saved to your own YouTube playlist. So you can always find it's very easy to find. So like the video and feel free to share whatever you want. And thank you mainly to Mary and Nimesh. It's been a pleasure as always. Do you want to say anything else before we go? Well, thank you for having me to burble on, on my favorite stuff. <laughs> thank you. And it's been great to hear Nimish's stuff bring it to life as well. So thanks. And make sure everyone gets a decent break, you know. Put your feet up. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's, it's great hearing from, from yourself as well, Mary. And uh, it's always great at these at these events, hearing from so many colleagues and all the questions they've got to ask. Yep, good. So 
Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening, everybody, and see you next time. Bye. <laughs>